Hi, it's Jo Bailey. Welcome to my Brain and Beyond channel where I talk about all things brain related. Today we're talking about baby psychopaths. Okay, so right out of the gates, I want to clarify something and it is very important, albeit somewhat uh, a confusing clarification. So indulge me just for a brief moment. So psychopathy is not actually a mental disorder as such. It's a construct, an idea in psychiatry, uh, a term commonly used to describe someone that the lay person might refer to as crazy or has lost their mind. But it's not a diagnosis that we will formally use. It's simply not found in the DSM or the ICD. Now these are the manuals or the codes that psychologists and psychiatrists use to officially diagnose someone. Psychopathy is a construct and it seems to have two main branches. The first branch is seen with people who are highly manipulative, who are deceitful, unemotional and callous in their presentation. Uh, they would be your typical psychopaths, so the Ted Bundys or the Jeffrey Dahmers. The second branch is the sociopathy side, so uh, it's also not in the ICD or the DSM. And this is where you find people that are very self-absorbed. They might take advantage of others. They have a sense of superiority or they may be manipulative and behave violently or impulsively. So there is a, a bit of an overlap between the two branches. The closest official diagnosis that we have that sort of uh, squashes the two branches together is actually a mental health condition called antisocial personality disorder, which is a recognized disorder in both the ICD and DSM. And whilst it has a very specific diagnostic criteria uh, that has to be met to, to diagnose someone with um, antisocial personality disorder, it's essentially characterized by a persistent disregard for the rights of others. So there's significant overlap between these, these two branches and terms are often used very interchangeably and confusingly. So antisocial personality disorder is often, but not always, uh, what we use to just describe sociopaths and psychopaths. So just to confuse you one more time, antisocial personality disorder cannot be diagnosed till at least 18 years of age. So what happens for our kids? I've just told you that really sociopathy isn't a term, psychopathy isn't really a clinical term, antisocial personality disorder describes both those, but we can't use that until 18 years of age. Well, for those under 18 years of age, we have another official diagnosis in the DSM that we can refer to, and it's called conduct disorder. And the features of, of this uh, I'll discuss shortly, but essentially it is the closest uh, diagnostic label that we have to a baby psychopath, um, insofar that those kids have serious problems uh, being controlled, but also they have the need to control others. So I guess the professionally adjusted question uh, for this video would be, does my child have conduct disorder on the path to antisocial personality disorder. Uh, but for the layperson and for the purpose of succinct communication here, I'm gonna go along with the common term psychopath uh, as a bit of a one size fits all. But I need you to know that to be true to my profession, it's not an accurate usage of the term. So the actual number of true psychopaths is actually quite low, uh, but a lot of violent crime uh, can be connected to the psychopathic personality. Um, indeed, some of the most barbaric crimes and certainly some of the most renowned serial killers, but again, not all, uh, possibly could be considered as psychopaths. Research indicates that psychopathy develops from a complex mix of both genetic and environmental factors, but it's, it's also generally agreed that psychopathy is chiefly a neurogenetic condition and it's related to the underdevelopment of brain regions, particular brain regions responsible for emotion regulation and impulse control. 
I've had my fair share of parents bringing along children to me over my years of doing this job, decades of doing this job, and they sometimes ask me, is my child a psychopath? But I think there's only one child that really stands out, a little boy that I remember uh, very clearly as perhaps being the only true psychopath that I ever saw, um, well, the childhood version of, of a psychopath, that is. And I met this child whilst working in my previous forensic role. Um, this little boy had tortured animals. He was a terrible bully from the time uh, he started preschool, actually. And he would bite and he would hit. He would initiate fights with other little kids for no particular reason other than some kind of self-satisfaction. Uh, he was extremely good at uh, manipulating and presenting in a manner that most likely fooled a lot of people. Um, people probably thought he was a very quiet and kind and kind-hearted boy. Um, but of course, that was all very duplicitous and manipulative. The child would run away. Uh, he was in trouble with the law uh, by age 11. He was um, known to police. He was truant in school. And I guess most uh, alarming or concerning of all was that he didn't come from a broken home. He didn't have a trauma background. He had a lot of loving people surrounding him, doing their best to take care of him. Uh, yet despite that, he, he didn't care who he hurt. And without going into some of the graphic detail, and there was a lot of graphic detail with him, he was uh, also responsible for the suffering of a family pet. Uh, sadly, this child is your stereotypical profile of a psychopath and was one of the most memorable of my psychiatric contacts. And it's important to tell you here that I, I see a lot of misdiagnosis in this field. Uh, just because a child is very difficult or oppositional in their behaviors does not mean that they should have a diagnosis of conduct disorder. Uh, not at all. Many other things better and often explain problem behaviors in children. But even if your child does have an accurate diagnosis of conduct disorder, the chance of that child going on to be a psychopath uh, or antisocial personality disorder is only about one in five. So it's pretty low, but you're probably here today wanting to know if this could be your child. Is it possible that your child could be or even end up being a psychopath? Well, chances are probably not, just based on the stats and all the variables that can also explain problematic and violent behaviours in children. But obviously, I'm not going to be able to diagnose your child without seeing them. So this information that I'm presenting here today is very general in nature. It's not meant to replace a professional's uh, clinical or diagnostic opinion. But if you do have genuine concerns, there are some signs and some risk factors that we could be looking out for. So today I'm going to present 10 of those signs to help you decide if you should be concerned. Number one is aggressive and dominating behaviors towards others or animals. Now this might include hurting or overpowering or intimidating people or animals that are smaller than oneself. Sometimes it's bigger than oneself, but often it's, uh, it's a sign of dominance. So children tend to pick on children either their own size or smaller, and they seem to enjoy that dominance and power. Number two is low levels of empathy or compassion or concern or guilt or remorse, not reacting to uh, the sadness or the pain or the suffering of others. Uh, this is when a child doesn't feel bad at all when they do something wrong or hurt someone else, especially people close to them. Um, with the example I was referring to earlier, that little boy, he would often hurt his mother um, to the point that his mum would be very upset and in tears. And I remember one time Time, the mum crying in the session, uh, a genuine heartfelt uh, wailing of just pain and grief. And the boy just sat there very indifferent. So with number two, we're looking at that really low level of compassion um, and inability to show understanding or interest in others in a time of need. 
Number three is a superficial or manipulative charm. Uh, it's usually put on for some self-serving purpose and it can be turned on or turned off as needed. But the charm is very disingenuous and it's only usually used to get something or manipulate someone into believing them. Uh, they're very good at lying. Number four is an area that's got a lot of research around it, and it's the callous and the unemotional traits. Now, this is a very clear and focused area in psychopathy, and it's similar to point one, but it's separate here because it may or it may not include aggression or dominance. Uh, it's similar in that it refers to a very, I guess, cruel and heartless disregard for life. But the callous and the emotionless child is unaffected by things that would often uh, aggrieve others. And if there is an emotional reaction in uh, the, the psychopathic child, it's often very spurious, very false and often short lived, quite a significant and notable deviation from the norm. Now, the fifth is a pretty well-known triad of behaviors, uh, commonly referred to as the McDonald triad, and it involves three parts, cruelty to animals, fire starting or an obsession with fire, and persistent bedwetting. Now, with the bedwetting, I do tread cautiously there because bedwetting can be also a part of a trauma presentation, a trauma behavior, so uh, do be careful there. But with the psychopathic child that I talked about earlier, he had a thing for urinating on others and on property. And whilst this is a, not a nice thing, I, th I think it really highlights that it's not just bedwetting, it's some really strange behaviors around urination and sometimes the fecal behaviors as well. But this is about dominance and it's much more likely to fit a psychopathic profile when it's combined with the other two parts of that McDonald triad, so the, the fire starting and the cruelty to animals. Now, in my time working in juvenile justice, it is a combination uh, of behaviors that I have seen a lot, but not always in the context of psychopathy. Uh, nevertheless, at least two of the McDonald triad, so hurting animals and arson, uh, comprise part of the diagnostic criteria for psychopathy in the DSM. And the ongoing bet wedding, as I mentioned, is a concerning behavior, but can sometimes be attributable or explained by other physical and psychiatric disorders too. Number six is criminal behavior. So even from a very young age, baby psychopaths are likely to get into trouble with the law. Uh, the seriousness of their deviant behaviors are hard to ignore or hard to miss uh, the police attention that they get. So often this happens before age 14 and it's not uncommon with children even younger than 10 sometimes. Now, this criminal behavior may be violent in nature, but it often starts with things like shoplifting or break and enters and these non-confrontational crimes. But criminal behavior is certainly one of the risk factors for a baby psychopath. Number seven is running away or truanting from school. Uh, it's a fairly common risk factor. We see it in a lot of children's profiles, but certainly we do see it in the early warning signs of psychopathy. Uh, or even, you know, a child may point blank refuse to go to school in the first place, and that might make the situation escalate into one that uh, incurs threats, threatening behavior, demands, or even explosive reactions on the part of the child. Number eight is property destruction and vandalism. Now the property destruction may be at home, it might be at school or a public place. But a blatant disregard for the property or the respect of others' hard work uh, or efforts may be seen from quite a young age. Number nine is one that we uh, often see in much younger children. So it may be children even as young as three, and it's ignoring uh, another child in distress or ignoring a child that's crying or hurt or in need of help. Now, most little kids, when they see another child crying, they'll respond in some way. 
but the brain of a baby psychopath is wired differently and they simply don't respond to the cues that would normally trigger or elicit an empathic emotion or pro-social response in other normal kids. Uh, they don't recognize distress in others so they might ignore or worse they might try and aggressively silence a crying child. Uh, as these children get older we may also see them want to look at disturbing or quite graphic images or video content. Um, <laughs> this is a challenging one in today's world where all sorts of horrible content is shared uh, way too freely and is way too accessible on the internet and in various forms of social media. But with a psychopathic child, there's a strong desire to seek out this content. It's not just this you know, superficial curiosity, but a lack of emotional response to the content as well. And to content that is very graphic and would uh, otherwise you know, elicit shock and, and horror from children. So this lack of emotional response from a very early age and then a desire to seek out content that is quite graphic and violent is a risk factor that we need to be looking out for. And the final one, number 10. Well, this one is a bit difficult to mention and it might be a bit triggering for some people, especially when it's been mentioned in the context of children. So I'm just giving you a bit of a warning about what I'm about to say. But number 10 is where we see children who are forcing sexual activity on another or they are coercing or possibly manipulating another child to engage in an age inappropriate activity with them or perhaps with someone else. Now I won't go into further detail here as that's I think descriptive and obvious enough what uh, what I mean but this kind of sexual deviancy and the sexual be sexualized behaviors comes uh, under a few categories here so it comes under uh, the, well obviously the sexual inappropriateness but it's really about dominance and control and aggression and of course it brings back that callousness and manipulation that we see throughout these warning signs of the psychopathic child. Uh, and that overarching theme of psychopathy, which is of course the total and blatant disregard for the rights and the feelings and the emotions of others. So if you have listened today to some of these risk factors and still have concerns for your child, then I strongly suggest that you reach out to a professional, either a GP or a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Ensure that you do find someone with good understanding of psychopathy or conduct disorder. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, true psychopaths are pretty rare and a misdiagnosis can cause even more problems and struggles for a child that may be experiencing trauma, uh, neglect, substance abuse or some other alternate explanation for their conduct problems. And if you have any other questions you can also reach out in the comment section below and I will endeavour to give you a brief answer there. Anyway that's it for now. Until next time I hope this has been helpful. Take care of yourselves and each other and have a very happy and peace-filled day. Bye for now.